Plastic surgeon Natasha Hidvegi is searching for the roots of plastic surgery deep in the past, in India, Egypt, and Greece. She has found that Alexander the Great, the most famous warrior of the ancient world, was also a pioneer of plastic surgery. Under his leadership, surgeons became an essential part of the Greek war machine. After Alexander's death, his successor, a general called Ptolemy, became the ruler of Egypt. Ptolemy promoted scientific knowledge and laid the foundations for plastic surgery in the ancient world. Alexandria became the center of the whole world's scientific and medical knowledge. Natasha has come here to discover if there's anything the ancient Greeks can still offer modern surgery. In Alexandria, the remains of the original Ptolemaic University have recently been uncovered. Judging by the size of the ruins, thousands of scientists must have come here to study. From here, the achievements of Greek medicine were to spread across the ancient world. This is one of the oval lecture rooms where the great physicians of the day would have come to teach anatomy. And the knowledge of anatomy, of course, is essential for plastic surgery. It was great being at the site of the old university, just imagining all the different academics and professors that would have been wandering around there. I just wish I could find out exactly what they were studying, how much, what was their knowledge of anatomy at that stage? How much did they know about surgery? The key to this was dissection, which in most early cultures was taboo. But in liberal Alexandria, sometime in the third century BC, a young physician named Herophilus was given permission to dissect human bodies. His findings revolutionized all kinds of surgery, including plastic surgery. Prior to Herophilus, no one had ever done systematic dissection of human cadavers. Herophilus achieved a remarkably detailed knowledge of the entire human body. For example, demonstrated the systematic anatomical distinction between arteries and veins. And perhaps most important, discovered the nerves and made the distinction between motor and sensory nerves. Distinguished between four coats of the eye discovered the ventricles of the brain and described them quite accurately. Most of today's understanding of the body comes straight from Herophilus and the discoveries he made 2,000 years ago. In the case of dissection, what is so extraordinary is that prior to Herophilus, no one had ever done systematic dissection of human cadavers. After him, it was never done again for another 15 centuries in any culture, in any part of the world. But it wasn't just dissection of cadavers. Herophilus was allowed to break an even bigger taboo. Carving up living humans, condemned criminals. Science was getting its own human sacrifice. Systematic vivisectory experimentation is cutting open living human beings in order to observe the functions of the internal parts in a living being. The justification for this was said to be that no matter how well one knows the dead body, the dead body is different from the living body. As horrific as these experiments were, they did give Herophilus and his students an unprecedented understanding of the human body, of the nerves, for instance, and the brain. The brain's importance was recognized for the first time 
greatly reducing the dominant beliefs in spirits and magic. Herophilus did not base his practice on the belief that diseases are sent to humans by gods as punishment or as rectification of any kind of moral or political disorder, but rather that diseases have natural causes, as most of the Hippocratics believed as well, and therefore diseases had to be addressed by secular means, by scientific means, that meant for him. His discoveries may have been the largest single step forward ever taken in medicine, all forms of it, including plastic surgery. After Herophilus, surgeons possessed a new understanding of the body, how it worked, and how they could repair it effectively. But it was a new power that would inherit and make use of this knowledge. In the first century before Christ, the Romans conquered Greece and Egypt. Under Roman rule, the Greek doctors were encouraged to develop new techniques in plastic surgery. It's not at all surprising that the Romans used Greek physicians because Greek medicine was incredibly sophisticated. That's because Romans distrusted most of the foreigners they'd conquered, and foreigners wanting to fit in would try to hide telltale differences. That wasn't always easy, especially in the public baths that every respectable Roman visited every day. The manly thing is to have battle scars, battle scars on your front. To have scars on your back is a mark of shame. It shows that you've turned your back in battle and run away. Uh, or worse, it shows that you've been whipped. And only a slave is whipped. And to have the marks of a whipping on your back is to disqualify you as a free man. And a slave who shows those signs of, of branding can never be, enjoy respect. Uh, he is compromised, stigmatized forever. And that is why it's so important to try to find ways of abolishing these signs. And that, that must be above all the push for, that's where you need surgery, when the marks of shame are on your body. Surgery under the Romans was gaining a definite cosmetic element. Natasha Hidvegi has found a reference in Martial, himself a foreigner, a Spaniard. There is some evidence from Martial that slaves had their brands removed by surgeons at that time. Unfortunately, there's no detail exactly how the surgery was done, but one can assume that it'd be pretty similar to what's done nowadays. If there was a brand, say, on my arm here, either that area could have been cut out and then sewn back together directly, so you'd be left with a long, linear scar, or you could just shave off the top of the brand to remove the detail of the brand, but you'd be left with a wide scar they wouldn't have the detail of the branding, and therefore the ex-slave or the freedman could pretend that he burnt his arm in an accident, etc. The operation would have been excruciating. The cause would have had to be desperate. And it wasn't just ex-slaves who suffered socially and then medically. Well, if you walked into a Roman bath and you were circumcised, then you certainly were a Jew or a Semite or something along those lines and a, a, a Roman may not wish to have appeared any such thing. So he's willing to submit to having his foreskin readjusted. <laughs> and there is a surgery uh, uh, for this very purpose described in Paul. Paul of Aegina, a Roman medical observer, witnessed a lot of experimental operations. This is his rather detached report on counter-circumcision. The prepuce is to be raised from the underlying penis round the circumference of the glands by means of a scalpel. This is not so very painful, for once the margin has been freed, it can be stripped up by hand as far as the pubis. The prepuce, thus freed, is again stretched forward beyond the glands. For the following days, the patient is to fast until nearly overcome by hunger lest satiety excite that part. As Greek physicians specialized more in cosmetic surgery, demand grew. By 46 BC, Julius Caesar was offering foreign doctors full citizenship 
and many Roman cities used tax incentives to get them to stay. But this was strictly private medicine, no set pay scale, only reputation determined prosperity. Just over there to the right, that's your In the ruins of Pompeii, turned into a time capsule by a volcanic eruption, Professor Ralph yeah. Jackson uh, takes the pressure to see a house today. that belonged to a Greek physician. Vesuvius just towering over everything, isn't it? It's just... The house was identified by its large stores of surgical equipment. So, Natasha, this rather ruinous and uh, indifferent looking mm. house is actually the most important surgical site at Pompeii. Right. In 1887, when they excavated this house, they found the largest number of surgical instruments from any site in Pompeii. Mm -hmm. And would they be recognised as surgical instruments today? Many of them certainly would. They've changed hardly at all. Well-designed, beautifully crafted instruments that mm -hmm. we would recognise. Mm -hmm. And those instruments were found just in the room adjacent to us, just down here, in fact. Okay. There were more than a hundred instruments here. Professor Jackson has a replica copy of a portable surgical kit. So what we've got here is a selection of replica instruments mm -hmm. and they represent the normal range of instruments that a Roman surgeon would have had. They're what I would call the core instruments that Roman surgeons mm. used. God, so these look fantastic. I mean, what, what are they made out of? Most of them are made from bronze, uh, brass, copper, things like mm -hmm. that. Um, but where there, the exception to that is where there are blades or um, needles, and those are almost invariably made of iron or steel. These are, look very similar to the types of instruments we would use today. I mean, these scalpels are very obviously scalpels, very beautifully crafted and quite sharp still. Um, this end, was that, did that have a function as well? Yeah, like many Roman surgical tools, the scalpel was double-ended. Uh -huh. You held it in the centre, this is the grip. You used the blade, but then you turned it round and used the other end, which is a blunt dissector. This, I presume, is a, a retractor, or looks like a retractor to me. It certainly would have been used for retraction, but a lot of other things mm. as well because instruments usually had several different functions. Mm -hmm. They were often double-ended and they had multiple uses as well. This actually was used in skull surgery amongst other things. Right, right. Maybe a skin hook? This is what we would use to retract the skin maybe? Yeah, just you sharp call it a skin hook. hook, I call it a sharp hook. <laughs> and, it, and it retracts the skin, exactly. But well, also, the they, also, they also used it to take out tonsils. You know, the, really? Uh, uh, yeah. And again, what these would be used for cautery or something? Yes, it's actually, I mean, it's a needle holder. Most of these instruments could actually be heated up and used as cauteries. Without realising it, they were, uh, he in heating the instrument as a cautery, they were sterilising it, and mm -hmm. it was probably the only time that they routinely sterilised an instrument, mm -hmm. because otherwise they had no concept of the need to do so. So, but would they just use it from one patient to the next, or...? They were used from one patient to the next, so... Oh. Nowadays, it's just such a horrendous thought. Of course. This is very sophisticated equipment, and Natasha remembers what she's read about other kinds of plastic surgery these Greek physicians were able to practice. Paula Vigina describes, for instance, a procedure to reduce the breasts of an obese man because, he says, they looked unsightly and shameful. In the naked society, being fat, apparently, was as bad as being an ex-slave or a Jew, and it was worth the pain to have the stigma erased. The physician himself, of course, had to be sympathetic and considerate. It was part of a code of conduct dating from Hippocrates. As Celsus wrote, a practitioner of experience does not seize the patient's forearm with his hand as soon as he comes in, but first sits down and with a cheerful smile asks how the patient finds himself. And if the patient has any fear, he calms him down with entertaining talk and only after that moves his hand to touch the patient. Now to reduce the size of a man's breast or a gynecomastia operation, which is what we'll call it today, if the breast tissue is mainly made out of fat, that fat is sucked away by liposuction. Obviously a technology 
that wouldn't have been available in those days. It would have been painful, and obviously the surgeon would have to be quick and slick and skilled to be able to do that. Bleeding would also have been a problem. It's a very vascular area, so there must have been either herbs or medicines that would have been able to staunch the blood flow and prevent infection. The social stigma of having large breasts must have been huge for that gentleman to be prepared to undergo that amount of an operation. Something I was going to ask you is that this type of surgery is very sophisticated but quite invasive. Did they have any types of anaesthetics? Pain, the question of pain. Yeah. Well, yeah, it was painful, but uh, there were some things, there were things that could be done. They didn't have what we would regard as a true anaesthetic, yeah. but there were various uh, plant extracts that they used, and many of the healers probably grew some of those plants in their own garden, and the house we're in has a garden. Oh, this right. surgeon may well have grown plants that had analgesic properties. Several of the houses of healers, the surgeons at Pompeii, were large enough, you know, they're wealthy enough to have reasonable sized gardens. Right. And they may well have grown a lot of their own medicines in those gardens. Wow, this is huge. Um, this is a kind of, this garden would be used as a functional garden or, a, or an aesthetic It garden? was used mainly for entertainment. Mm. I mean, they like to eat out in their gardens. They... But would they grow any of the herbs that they're using? In... I think it's difficult to believe that they wouldn't. Yeah. Uh, you know, surgery medicine is essentially a practical craft, and so they will have grown herbs and healing plants of one kind or another. There was a long tradition in Roman Italy um, of um, self-sufficiency and growing healing yeah. plants. So what kind of plants do they use for pain relief? Of well, pain relief, there were three important ones, opium poppy, white uh, mandrake and henbane. And uh, these were the sorts of things that would have given, you know, quite good results. It's like a partial uh, anaesthetic, I suppose, a pre-med, especially um, white mandrake, which oh. Pliny says you only need a sniff of before an operation to send you to sleep. So it make the patient drowsy but not completely asleep. Exactly. Now, whether we can imagine these things being grown around the walls here, who knows? Uh -huh. But if, if the patient wasn't completely asleep, then obviously they can move around in pain. The, pa the surgeon would have to be quite skilled and quick to do this invasive operation. Absolutely. It's not at all like today when you've got uh, hours. You know, they had minutes, and that's why they had their kits of instruments were, you know, the tools were double-ended. They needed a small number of instruments that covered most eventualities, which they could turn around and use very, very quickly if the patient wasn't going to die of surgical shock. Like surgery itself, drugs were a speciality of the Greeks. The flourishing of their medicine had coincided with their great empire, and it had access to narcotic plants from all over the known world. And now, under the Romans, they were careful to keep their formulae secret. Already in the Odyssey, Helen, Helen of Troy, mentions a drug that will make people forget all their pain and all their sorrows. And she says it's a drug from Egypt. And she says, if you take this drug, even if your closest relation is killed, a child or a parent, you won't weep, you won't feel pain, you won't feel sorrow. No, we have no idea exactly what this drug was, what it might have been composed of, if it was indeed a compound drug, but it's clear that the idea that drugs can help one to avoid pain, to avoid the sensation of being hurt in a variety of ways, physical and otherwise, is something that existed. Someone who might have an idea about what that was is the American professor John Riddle, whose life's work has been to study the drugs available to Greek physicians. This is Helleborus niger, which is one of the most interesting plants because the Greeks considered it to be one of the most powerful plants that they knew of because it uh, has analgesic qualities, narcotic qualities. It was probably used in rituals, and almost certainly it was used for uh, surgical operations, uh, quote, so that the patient will feel no pain.
Professor Riddle is running tests on the chemical compounds of many drugs the ancient physicians used, among them Helibor. It has a chemical in it called atropine. Now this drug indeed does work. We know that when we recompound that group, that a person will go into a, uh, a sleep, a coma, that will last approximately 36 hours. And so from the ancient Greeks, using it for surgery, using it for ritual, this black hellebore uh, is a very, very powerful plant. It's still true today. In a stroll through a Middle Eastern market, it's possible to find a wide variety of local, natural answers to everything, including the problem of pain control. The ancients had a huge range of pharmacopoeia to help with pain relief and with anesthetics for the operations. And that, in some ways, would seem surprising, but you have to remember that so much of our pain relief nowadays, such as aspirin and opiate-based medicines, such as codeine, are based on ancient herbs and the knowledge that was developed then. Do you have anything for the wounds, if you cut? This is like oil. This for like, you know. So th what's this from? For the beast like this. That's oil and beast like this. Good. Mm. So this there is a huge range of potential drugs out there in the natural world, which we have yet to discover, which I'm sure that in the ancient world they did know about and used to their full potential. came when a brilliant young Greek entered the Roman arena, not as a gladiator, but as a surgeon. Staging death as spectacular entertainment was typical of the empire's arrogance. We do whatever we want to do. Soon after the Romans conquered the place, colosseums sprang up. One of the largest was in Pergamon in Asia Minor. Every week, a crowd of 20,000 would come to watch paired off slaves try to kill each other. But they were very valuable slaves, and as much as possible, their owners wanted to protect their investments. Since the winners were quite often nearly dead themselves, medical attention was in great demand. And the best doctors were almost always Greek. So for a young Alexandria-educated and ambitious Greek physician in 157 AD, few jobs could be better than resident surgeon at the Pergamum Colosseum. This was Claudius Galen. The gladiator period was, was crucial to what he did later because it, it, as close as you could come to vivisection, would have been the gladiatorial world where you're a gladiator doctor. He had certainly access through wounds to see much of what other people might not have been able to see who, who weren't attending on gladiators or soldiers. So in an age when he couldn't practice vivisection, I think it was a very important thing for him. Well, of course, for him, this was great. At a time when the dissection of, uh, of human cadavers was not the norm, gladiators wounded in all sorts of ways, maybe disemboweled, uh, mainly probably leg wounds and arm wounds, this did give him the opportunity to see anatomy. He says, for example, that in his term as physician to the gladiators, not one of them died. We can perhaps believe that statistic because the kinds of things that he was doing, um, the way that he was operating on thigh wounds and things like that, his descriptions are such as to uh, allow us to believe that he was successful. But besides being an excellent physician, Galen was a great showman and self-promoter and it didn't take long for his name to be known in the highest circles. Circles much too high for provincial Pergamon. At 
1932, he felt it was time to move on. In 161 AD, there was only one place Galen could move on to. And when he got to Rome, he became nothing less than resident surgeon in the Great Colosseum. But even that wasn't as high as he could go. He was an accomplished physician. And I don't think he would have become imperial physician. I don't think he would have become doctor, the doctor to the famous Emperor Marcus Aurelius if he weren't effective. Marcus Aurelius Antoninus, Emperor of Rome, stoic philosopher and proud patron of Galen. He wanted to wean his subjects away from superstition, and he encouraged Galen to disseminate his scientific approach to surgery. Other ideas then sprang from other quarters. Plastic surgery flourished, and in one case, there was even a possible sex change. But up in the middle is Marcus Aurelius, who is the ideal emperor of all times. Uh, the, the gilded golden boy of Roman rule. He's the emperor who brings Galen to Rome. And Galen's one of many intellectuals. Uh, Marcus is one of the most extraordinarily enlightened emperors. Mm -hmm. He's a stoic philosopher. Right. And that you get okay. from his meditations. Right. And constantly trying to find a point of balance. Mm -hmm. He believes that there is a divine message out there that the world should be ordered. Mm -hmm. And he as an emperor is trying to bring order into the world he rules. And is that why he brought Galen in, to heal his populace? Absolutely. In some sense, he is, is providing a salvation for the world and Galen a, a medical salvation for the people. Ah, corollaries of each other, I suppose. That's right. Um, um, a reciprocal role. Uh -huh. Galen was as eager as the emperor to disseminate his scientific way of thinking. And from his post as imperial physician, he became the most prolific medical writer ever. He produced 60 terms on every aspect of medical theory and practice that then existed. I think Galen was as important as he was because he had access to the highest people, to the imperial palace. Uh, what more could you want? And then as time goes on, of course, we have this huge corpus of work that comes down from his hand. And whatever he was in his own time, this corpus of work was bound to have had a considerable impact subsequently when no further significant advances were made in medicine for centuries and centuries and centuries. I mean, essentially, we were still practicing Galenic and Hippocratic medicine probably not two centuries ago. Almost single-handedly, Galen had created a golden age of medicine, and that included plastic surgery. During his time, cosmetic and reconstructive surgery got ever more daring. The eye is an incredibly sensitive instrument of the body and incredibly difficult to operate on even nowadays. Before Galen, the only operations they would attempt to cure would be a, a cataract. After Galing, they could try and cure squints, correct droopy eyelids and infections of the eye. And to be able to do that, they must have been not only skilled physicians and surgeons, they must have very delicate instruments and understand anatomically the structure of the eye. Their knowledge must have been vast. And eyes were only part of it. Fashions were changing, not just in clothes, but in bodies themselves. And in the perception of the body. In the all-important bars, nudity was normal. Under Marcus Aurelius, wars had been banished to the frontiers of the empire, while in Rome itself, there were new obsessions, including the human body. It's almost as if you've got two parallel streams of fashion running along together. Say you take the end of the first century BC, you've still got very strongly this idea that we tough Romans, we don't mind being old and wrinkled and warty mm. because what matters is what we have achieved, not mm. what we look like. We don't go for superficial appearances. Mm. And at exactly the same time, 
you get Romans presented as the body beautiful. Yeah. And so you get the, these enormous contradictions. You get, you get statues of emperors like Augustus, completely naked, with the bodies of Greek athletes. Yeah. The men have all those signs that make you manly. Uh -huh. The women have all those signs that make you womanly. So you must be, must be soft and unblemished. And oddly enough, despite this pride in, in, in Romans having warts and wrinkles, the women don't have warts and wrinkles. OK, so they have to disguise the, women, the imperfections. They do. To judge by the statues, the Roman body beautiful meant the male body. But women's bodies were under public scrutiny too. There is mention of, of a woman undergoing a clitorectomy. Now, I can only suppose that she probably had a type of intersex condition and her clitoris was obviously invisibly enlarged to such an extent that it caused her embarrassment and therefore she had to and was willing to undergo this obviously very painful and bloody procedure. It's interesting that a number of these uh, so-called plastic surgeries have got something to do with the genitalia. In a world where people appeared so often in public, we have people with both sexual organs wanting those corrected. We have clitorectomy. We have the pec operation. We have also um, uh, what's called rachosis, or uh, I think probably distended scrotum, uh, where, which can be corrected by hacking off a portion of the scrotum. Natasha is surprised to find that nearly 2,000 years ago, such invasive and intricate surgery was even possible. But how many people would have had these operations? When I think about what we know about ancient medicine, I'm thinking basically that the texts that come down to us are texts by the best people around. And their clients were the richest people around, and that's a very thin element of the population. So in talking about things like, you know, adjustment of male pecs or operations on the genitalia, uh, things of that nature, I doubt that very many people had access to anything like that. Emperors, of course, were at the top of that top layer, and a young successor to Marcus Aurelius really pushed the limits when he demanded a sex change. Elagabalus was possibly the most decadent emperor in Rome's long history of decadence. According to one commentator, he lived in a depraved manner, indulging unnatural vice with men deeming the chief enjoyment in life to arouse the lusts of the greatest number. Elagabalus came from a very exotic corner of the empire, from the city of Emesa in Syria, a city where religions were practiced that were very strange and partly offensive to Romans. So Elagabalus gets the most spectacularly bad press. But of course, the way they get at him is sexual. And undoubtedly, I mean, let's not pretend that Elagabalus was a sexual innocent. But all the stories about him are about sexual excess. The story about Elagabalus playing the prostitute was widespread in the literature of the day. These stories have this gossipy flavor to them. They're wonderful, they're wonderful stories. The respected commentator Cassius Dio wrote, He frequented the notorious brothels by night wearing a wig and plied the trade of a prostitute, committing his indecencies there. It reflected the concerns that they had that Elagabalus was a young man who was incapable of fulfilling the masculine role of being an emperor. This guy called Cassius Dio, he was there at the time, and he says that Elagabalus tried to turn himself into a woman, and that he offered the surgeons any money they asked to give him a vagina. There's a famous 
saying by the jurist Ulpian that whatever the emperor wants has the force of a law. And so if an emperor desires it, he has the empire uh, at his beck and call. But was that operation even remotely possible then? We asked the specialist sex change doctor. You're making a space that doesn't exist. So you have to find this space and you have to dissect this space without tearing into the rectum or tearing into, you know, the urethra or whatever. So, so you know, that's, you don't have a big margin for error. You have to, uh, you have to really know what you're doing. What, what the surgeon probably did is say, okay, I'll cut off his penis, I'll cut off his testicles. I'll kind of hang the skin of his scrotum a certain way so that maybe I can make some kind of a pouch. And that's it. No, I think it's extremely likely that the story is just one of the stories told against Elagabalus. You can never be certain that any accusation made against any Roman emperor, and they all pick up a whole range of exotic stories, is actually based in truth. But it's very interesting that they could come up with a story like that. The emperor's depravity and lack of masculinity finally infuriated the populace. At the tender age of 18, he and his mother were arrested by soldiers. They were dragged away and killed, and their bodies were slung into the Tiber. It will remain a mystery whether or not the soldiers had murdered the first and only Roman Empress. Creation of a new vagina is a very difficult operation. We don't know whether it happened or not. But what we can say that even with Elicabalus thinking it or wishing it or even asking for it, it meant that the possibility was there and plastic surgery had moved onto the stage that these kinds of thoughts were possible and these kind of operations might have been possible in the ancient times. Whatever the truth of this story, at the beginning of the third century AD, surgery was enjoying a golden age. And complex cosmetic surgery was still being practiced throughout the Roman Empire. While Rome, the cultural and political capital, benefited most from these advances, Alexandria remained the seat of medical learning, even under Roman rule. Alexandria had this tremendous, this golden period, if you like, of, of progress, of scientific, truly scientific discovery. It's fascinating. And that science, all that learning, revolved around the great library with its 700,000 scrolls. Here was where the circumference of the earth was measured, where the stars were plotted, where Herophilus recorded that the brain, not the heart, was the center of thought. But fast approaching was the end of both this golden age and the library itself. By the beginning of the fifth century, the scrolls had been deliberately burnt. Exactly who did it isn't clear, though most suspicion is cast on the early Christians who were violently opposed to pagan science. Today, near where the old library stood, there's a new one. Natasha has come to visit the $230 million Bibliotheca Alexandria, the largest library in Africa. It's a futuristic building, big enough to house four million books. As a center of research, it's designed to recapture the spirit of the ancient library of which only a tiny fragment survives. Of course, the ancient library of Alexandria contained hundreds of thousands of scrolls, but following the Great Fire, all of them were destroyed, unfortunately. 
except for this one papyrus. Okay. Uh, it's the only remaining papyrus from the ancient library of Alexandria. It's written in ancient Greek, and what we've deciphered is that it's actually an index of some of the scrolls which were present at that time in the library. It is like many things in antiquity. The spotlight is on a certain place at a certain time, and then the spotlight goes out and it moves somewhere else. And so suddenly the spotlight goes out on, on Alexandria. The end of the library coincided with the end of the Roman Empire and of all things we call ancient, including ancient plastic surgery. The problem with medicine after the fall of the Roman Empire is that uh, the Roman Empire fell, if you like, because of a sort of decentralization. And so these long distance networks, to a great extent, fell apart. There's lack of central authority. Under those circumstances, um, things like uh, medicine, the universality of it, also um, falls apart. That's not to say that medicine wasn't still practiced, but you no longer have that great center. And when the center of medical knowledge went, losses rippled through the empire. Everywhere, great medical works disappeared, either destroyed or lost to time. We shouldn't forget that despite the enormous wealth of medical literature that we have from antiquity and the enormous wealth of archaeological finds, that we only have a fragment, a tiny fragment of what was written. We only have a tiny fragment of what was buried by time. So we know very little given what once was there. Of Galen's 60 books, for instance, just 20 survive. It so happens that Galen's works have survived, in part because he was translated on a massive scale into Arabic in the ninth century. The Arabs, as they conquered, preserved some ancient texts, and it was through their translations that many great works survived. Yet the Arabs rarely practiced invasive surgery. As for the Western Christians, they abolished surgery in both knowledge and practice. It was pagan and it was a sin. So the end of the Great Library and of the Roman Empire is also the end of Natasha's journey through the past. But what will she do with what she's learned about ancient plastic surgery? back in London and back at work. Today she's operating alongside consultant plastic surgeon Martin Kelly. Kelly is a world specialist on facial reconstruction. Morning, Roger. How are you? Hi. Morning. Morning. Neil Wandawa, anesthetist. Hi, Neil. Hi there. How are you? Hi, good. You well? Thanks. Yes, very good. Thanks. Looking very relaxed. Natasha and yeah. Kelly. We'll be rebuilding this patient's nose, According to which has been partially to do, amputated so to cut out a cancerous growth. You know, you've had a tumour excised from here, and that tells us that you had a, a cancer of the skin, but also we know from looking at that under the microscope that the rest of the skin in this area from biopsy is not quite normal. And so what we're going to do today is remove the rest of that skin and rebuild that side of the nose using skin from the forehead. And a few cartilage Natasha from can the reflect septum, now which is the on how much of today's medicine was initiated in antiquity. A few weeks. Right. With a skin graft on it, it tends to heal very quickly. But it shouldn't be too painful at all. I yeah. think you'll find that Dr. Randauer manages the, the slight discomfort you might have uh, very effectively, and I don't think you'll find it a... More expertise. Exactly. We'll have a chance in a moment. Not a difficult yeah, procedure to go through. The operation starts with pain-relieving drugs much as the ancient operations did. The actual surgery used to reconstruct Roger's nose is the same as the surgery recorded in India by Sir Shruta in 500 BC. The instruments in the tray are very like the ones the Romans used. Diathermic cauterizer stems the flow of blood. 
It uses electricity instead of direct heat. But it's the same principle recorded by the Egyptians 4,000 years ago. Antiseptics are used to speed recovery. There have been many developments in these over the millennia, but the ancients did have some antiseptic drugs. Modern plastic surgeons, of course, offer plenty of innovations, such as the use of cartilage for reshaping the nose. But the suturing, to keep it in place, has been practiced from Egyptian times onwards. Ancient physicians such as Ka in Egypt, Sushruta in India, and Galen in Rome have illuminated the way for modern plastic surgeons. And today's patient gets the benefit of the whole of this accumulated wisdom. Look at this patient here. This is a young lady who had a tumor on the, at the tip of the nose, which is a morphic basal cell carcinoma. It's the worst type of basal mm -hmm. cell a skin tumor that we believe is induced by excessive sun exposure. Mm. That's what she started off like. And here she is immediately after the first operation. Mm. You can see the sutures have just been removed. 18 mm -hmm. months ago, really Jacqueline had her nose patient, reconstructed. Operation, they have to accept, her plastic surgeon, you know, Martin weeks, Kelly, used more or less the same techniques practiced by Sir Schroeter 25 centuries ago. This is going and the result? quite well up here, isn't it? Do you have any trouble with I look at you as well? Of course not. <laughs> oh, it looks amazing. You barely notice it at all. Thank you. Do you find people pick up on the tip of your nose and comment no. on it? They don't. Well, that's that's good. No. I don't feel conscious of it at all. Um, good. Yeah. You know, each month it goes on, it seems to sort of... Blend be in. Work, ...working its way sort of back. Yes. Uh -huh. Natasha is no longer amazed by the sophistication of the ancients. After all, there were good doctors then, too. All in all, what I've learned is that we have so much to learn from the past, and I hope that modern medicine can open its eyes and accept that and realize that there are so many things we can learn from the ancients that can help us with modern medicine in the future. Over the coming months, Natasha will be collating and sifting through the things she's learned about ancient drugs, equipment, philosophies, and procedures. Will any of these lead directly to advances in modern plastic surgery? She can only wait and see. But whether they do or not, Natasha, the modern surgeon, has learned this about her ancient counterparts. They were good at it. They exceeded their limitations and they were prepared to take the risks and suffer the pain.